I'm curious about uh, the, uh, the pool of molten steel that was found in the bottom of the, of the tower. Um, I, I am too. And <laughs> please tell me about it. Have you, have you seen it? Why? Well, not personally, but my witnesses there found huge poles of molten steel beneath the towers. And uh, scientists, some scientists, don't think that the uh, collapse of the building could have melt, melted all that steel. And uh, uh, professor, physics professor, analyzed some of the steel. <laughs> and uh, Stephen Jones, and he found evidence of. Uh, of thermate residue, mm -hmm. which would explain how the buildings collapsed by means of pre-planted explosives. So, have you analyzed the uh, the steel for uh, any of those residues? Um, first of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who said so. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, like a molten line. steel running down the channel rails. Like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like lava. Like, like, it was like lava. lava. A volcano. The fires got very intense down there and it actually melted beams where it was molten steel that was being dug out. It's this fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel and concrete and all of these things all fused by the heat into one single element. And almost like a chunk of lava from Kilauea or Iceland where they're very sharp but, but breakable shards on the end here. This eight-ton steel I-beam is six inches thick. It was selected to be preserved for future generations for the near-perfect horseshoe-like bend formed during the collapse. I found it hard to believe that it actually bent because of the size of it and how there's no cracks in the iron. It bent without almost a single crack in it. It takes thousands of degrees to bend steel like this. Typically you'd have buckling and tearing on the tension side, but there's no buckling at all. You saw it steel, some of the thickest steel I've ever seen bent like a pretzel. And you just couldn't imagine the force that that took. Where the grapplers were, were pulling stuff out, uh, big sections of iron that were literally on fire on the other end. They would hit the air and burst into flames, which was uh, pretty spooky to see. There was even a point where um, you would create an air pocket by moving steel, fueling the fight on the ground, it would ignite cars and cars would just blow up. But, you know, these underground fires were just uh, like the fires of hell. Underground, it was still so hot that molten metal dripped down the sides of a wall from Building 6. There were fires of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit below the ground. This is how it's been since day one. Oh, it's unbelievable. And this is six weeks later, almost six weeks later. And as we get closer to the center of this, it gets hotter and hotter. It's probably 1,500 degrees. We've had some small windows into um, what we thought was a board at some point, and it looked like a, uh, an oven, you know, it was just roaring inside. And it's just a bright, bright reddish-orange color. See that stuff he's pulling out? What was that, Chief? You're gonna hold, we're going to hold off on the water. See the stuff he's pulling out? Yeah. It's red hot. If we hit it too much steam, you won't be able to see okay. what he's doing. Great. You see how this debris is still smoking? That's from the fires that are still burning. Eight weeks later, we still got fires burning. Every now and then, one of the pieces of equipment will dig in, will open up a small area, the oxygen will rush in, and you'll get this plume of brown, black smoke coming up. That's because that fire just got more oxygen. So, I mean, these things are burning. At one point, I think they were about 2,800 degrees.
And all of a sudden, he comes out of this little tunnel, screaming, wait till you see what I found. And he pulls in ministers and uh, officials, and there, this cross is fully extended, melted together with the intense heat. The two beams were never initially part of the same structure. Heat literally melted them together. And the piece of metal that's draped over was molten metal that had literally fallen over one of the arms. Steel-toed boots is one of the biggest things. Um, steel-toed boots? Steel-toed boots. Out, still on the rubble, it's still, uh, I believe, 1,100 degrees. The guy's boots just melt within a few hours. It was literally steaming. Your boots would melt in certain areas. That's how hot it was. The steel was coming out red in certain areas from the first couple of weeks at least. Go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten, molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, no eyewitness who said so, nobody who's produced it. Uh, I was on the site, I was on the steel yards, so I can't, I don't know that that's so. There's uh, video so of it. It melted around 2,600 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, I think it's probably pretty difficult to get that kind of uh, uh, temperatures in a, um, uh, in a fire. So I, I don't know the basis. I, I can't uh, you know, address your question if, uh, if I don't know the basis. Well, NASA pictures, uh, thermal uh, images showed those, those sorts of temperatures in the basement. Would you send them to me? Okay. My name is Mark, and I'm the individual who was questioning Dr. Gross, and he asked me to email to him those thermal images. When I approached him after his talk to get his email address for that purpose, he refused to provide it to me. I think this is important because it reveals the attitude of the NIST investigators, which is one of willful ignorance of what really happened on 9-11. What produced all this molten metal? And what is thermite anyway? Thermite. An incendiary used by the military? Thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. But is there evidence of thermite in the World Trade Center dust? Dr. Jones received no less than four separate samples of World Trade Center dust, some of it from Jeanette McKinley's apartment across the street, where the windows blew in and filled her apartment with dust. Another sample was found uh, like 10 minutes later on the Brooklyn Bridge. Well, he takes this and he puts a magnet over it, and he finds that there are small particles that come up to the magnet. Some of them are angular, some of them are round. They look like this. In fact, he calculates by the weight of the amount of these spheres that he finds in the dust that there must have been about 10 tons for the whole, for all of the dust that was available. They're about a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, the largest ones, and most of them, though, are smaller in a human hair. Would there possibly be any unignited thermite pieces in the World Trade Center dust. Indeed, he finds it. It also comes up to the magnet from his dust samples. Many chips. This one, a sixteenth of an inch long, red on one side, gray on the other. The red side is composed of tiny iron oxide particles and, and aluminum. The Lawrence Livermore lab came out with papers only a year or two ago about this stuff. The particles being so small allow for almost instantaneous ignition between the two chemicals, the aluminum and the iron oxide, producing very explosive results. He continues his study and finds additional chips that are partially ignited with spheres embedded in them, indicating that the source of the spheres is, for all intents and purposes, identified very clearly. With Dr. Jones and his small team of scientists, through EDS, XRF, and WDS, identifies the components of these spheres and chips, predominantly iron, along with aluminum, oxygen, silicon, 1,3-diphenylpropane, 
The results coupled with the visual evidence, he says, at the scene, such as the flowing hot liquid metal, providing compelling evidence that thermite reaction compounds were deliberately placed in both World Trade Center towers and Building 7. These results are documented in a peer-reviewed journal. Can I tell you something? I got to tell you one thing.